Thank you for joining me in the History of Science Collections of the University of Oklahoma Libraries. Let's look at a few treasures from the vault that throw light on natural history in the 16th century. This massive set is the natural history of Ulysses Aldrovandi, who worked in Bologna at the end of the 1500s. There are volumes devoted to mammals, birds, fish, trees, and minerals. Aldrovandi wants to tell us everything that is known about any animal. These books are a masterful achievement of emblematic natural history, aiming to document not only what we would call an animal's biology or ecology, but also to place it in the entire web of meaning. Does this animal live in Italy? Does it appear in Homer? What does it mean in iconography if you find it in a painting or on a coin or in a poem? Why wouldn't you want to know about all of these things? Aldrovandi's volume on serpents describes those from northern Italy with great accuracy. Yet other serpents have been reported in literature and travelers' tales. Why should they not be included? Aldrovandi warned the reader that he could not vouch for everything he reported, yet he judged it better to let the reader decide for himself than to take a risk that the report might be lost. This is Aldrovandi's volume on monsters. Some of these we can recognize as quite plausible birth defects, as well attested in our time as they must have seemed marvelous and inexplicable then. Natural history provided a key to one of the most important questions of natural philosophy. What do rare and irregular events reveal about the natural order? This is one of my favorite early printed herbals, De Historia Sterpium, a history or description of plants, published in Basel in 1542 by Leonard Fuchs. Fuchs' plants are drawn from life and given a German name as well as the traditional Latin. Fuchs' cherries are quite recognizable. At the end, Fuchs shares credit with the artist and the woodblock carver who assisted him. Although not shown are the women who likely were the artists who hand colored select copies such as this one. The Herbal of John Gerard, published in 1597, accomplished for England what Fuchs Herbal did for the German speaking parts of Northern Europe. Yet Gerard, an estate manager for Queen Elizabeth I's chief executive, was in contact with naturalists around the world who sent him both plants and soil to grow them in. The first illustration of the Virginia potato appears in Girard. Imagine how the history of the world would be different if the potato had never been brought to Europe from the New World. Girard grew and described many plants from the New World, including squash, pumpkins, gourds, and turkey corn. Turkey corn was cultivated by the Mayans and was a staple crop in the Americas. This herbal is part of the Galileo collection, for it was published by Galileo's friends and associates in the Academia dei Lincei, the Academy of the Lynx. It is the first natural history of the New World to be printed in Europe by Francisco Hernandez. In the late 16th century, Hernandez lived among the Aztecs in central Mexico and collected their knowledge of plants and medicines. The descriptions include Aztec names and medicinal lore for New World plants. The result was this monumental natural history of the New World incorporating approximately 800 woodcut illustrations. Federico Chesi and the Academia de Lincei issued two preliminary copies in 1628. Widely anticipated as a guide to the Fountain of Youth, Francesco Stelluti finally printed a revised version in 1650. The Oklahoma copy consists of the original sheets of the 1628 printing, together with a later preliminary gathering of the five first leaves, including the 1650 title page. The dramatic increase in knowledge of new world plants and animals, which we may represent by Hernandez Herbal, 
meant the end of natural history in the emblematic mode of Aldrovandi. These plants and animals had no previous store of associations for Europeans, no established iconography, no literary illusions. The natural knowledge of the peoples of the Western Hemisphere shook the foundations of early modern natural history. Fabio Colonna, a member of the Lincei and a major contributor to the Hernandez natural history, published the first book containing copper plate engravings of plants. These engravings show much more detail than was possible with woodcuts, as you can see by comparing the woodcut borders with the engravings of the plants themselves. Kalana attempted to standardize botanical terms in this book. For example, he coined the term petal. With Kalona, natural history was being transformed into botany. In this little treatise, Giovanni Anfassi, an 18th century Venetian physician, discussed the origin, composition, and medicinal use of chocolate. He surveyed arguments, both pro and con, for drinking chocolate. Ultimately, Anfasi praised the use of chocolate for its high nutritional value, its aphrodisiac qualities, and as a cure for all sorts of physical maladies. But what about kids? Chocolate might make them high strung, Anfasi concluded. So he recommended that chocolate, like coffee, was harmful to children and should be reserved only for adults. The Oklahoma copy is bound in contemporary hand-painted Venetian wrappers illustrating the cocoa bean plant. I myself consider chocolate a vegetable since it comes from beans. In this book, Edward Tyson studied the orangutan, which was actually a chimpanzee. It's a foundational work of comparative anatomy published in 1699. The second edition includes an appendix on the American rattlesnake. Aldrovandi's emblematic natural history was not the only casualty of increasing knowledge in a new global natural history. What did this unexpected diversity of life from the new world, from Indonesia, from outside Europe, mean for human history? In Sacred Origins, Bishop Edward Stillingfleet argued that the distribution of life on Earth required a dissociation between human history and natural history. It was no longer plausible to think that New World plants and animals could all have fit inside Noah's Ark, or that they might have dispersed from the Ark to their faraway continents in the patterns of distribution we now observe. Therefore, the bishop argued, Noah's flood must have been only a regional event instead of a global one. Stillingfleet provoked a response from Thomas Burnett, a Cambridge Platonist who valued the consilience of ancient testimony, both sacred text and pagan mythology, for a global deluge. In his Theory of the Earth, Burnett therefore sought to save a global extent of Noah's deluge by arguing that Adam and Eve first populated one hemisphere in a Garden of Eden with New World plants and animals before being miraculously translated to a second Garden of Eden in the Old World. The two gardens are indicated on this map of the primeval world by two sets of trees. Ironically, Burnett lost his job as physician to the king because his insistence on the global deluge led him to dismiss the pre-human origin of mountains on the third day of the creation week. Science is a story. What stories do you want to hear and tell about 16th century natural history?